Bon, ben, on doit se faire un loi comme ça. Just, just give us two minutes. We are trying to solve some technical issues. Uh, we'll start very soon. It's better this way. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. I understand. Both steers. Okay. Cool. Hello everyone. Um, it's working, right? Hello everyone. Welcome, welcome to our event. And I'm Mira Karka. I'm one of the ECS volunteers. Okay. So let me introduce to our speaker today. She is Florence Colium. She is a representative of SCAR, which is Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research, and she is a paleoclimate modeler. And uh, she will be talking today about West Antarctic ice dynamics and why it is such a threat. Thank you. Welcome, Flo. Okay. That's okay this way? Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Um, that's a bit of uh, a <laughs> very fast preparation uh, presentation to, to explain you a bit, a bit about West Antarctica because half of the day will be also dedicated to East Antarctica with uh, Chris talks. So we, we, we thought it was fair enough to also speak about West Antarctica. <laughs> okay, so um, Antarctica, uh, it's, it's a big, big ice sheet, okay? Uh, geographically, it is cut in two main parts, let's say, by a big mountain range that are called the Transantarctic Mountains, okay? They go from the, um, the Ross Sea sector, which is uh, close in front of the New Zealand uh, sector, and they just uh, go across most of Antarctica up to the peninsula, okay? So tectonically, the, those are two different plates. And um, they separate Antarctica into two main ice domes, let's say, there are plenty of domes of Antarctica, but two main uh, ice entity. East Antarctica, that contains most of the ice volume, that if would met completely would rise global mean sea level by uh, about 50, 52 meters. And West Antarctica, okay, uh, here on the left hand and part that contains about five meters of uh, sea level equivalent, okay, would rise sea level by five meters if it would met completely. Um, Antarctica is, uh, is quite complex, okay, and I, I will explain uh, everything uh, in a moment. It has some sectors that are called what we call marine based, okay, and as, as such, they are uh, vulnerable to oceanic warming, and I will explain what that means. Actually, uh, so the ice that accumulated on the continents, okay, is flowing because the ice is, is a medium that deforms uh, uh, under the action of gravity and, uh, and temperature of the, of the ice itself. So it flows toward the ocean and when it arrives to the ocean, it starts floating. It creates some termination platform 
that that slots that are about um, 400 to 200 meters thick at the front. Okay, and those platforms are, are called ice shelf. Um, so Antarctica is full of this marine termination of, uh, of glaciers, much more than Greenland, for, for, for example. And um, most, of, most of them are, are much larger because Antarctica is much larger than Greenland also. So the, the, the particularity of Antarctica is to have most of the outlet glaciers floating on the, on the ocean. So it makes them, the floating part, very vulnerable to oceanic warming. Um, so... Um, Ice velocity is what really determines uh, how fast ice, ice discharge into the ocean and how fast Antarctic ice contributes to sea level rise. So if we look at satellite reconstructed velocity, um, in the interior where you see the, let's say, orange color, the velocities of the ice flow are a few centimeters per year, okay? And while flowing to the margins, okay, uh, with the slope of the ice sheet itself and uh, the, it arrives to the ocean, when it arrives to the ocean, let's see if we can do that again. Yeah. When arriving to the ocean, okay, the ice velocity accelerates because there is no friction. I mean, on the continent, the ice is flowing on the bedrock, okay, so it has a lot of friction at the base, and that's, that's why the flow of ice is a few centimeters per year, so it's quite, off, it's quite slow. If we stay on the ice sheet, we barely see it advancing, okay? But when we arrive to the coast, okay, you see all those magenta colors, you see the streams uh, lines here, that shows that the ice flow is accelerating because of slopes and also because when arriving to the ocean, there is no friction anymore, it's water. So the, the velocity accelerates up to a few kilometers per year, okay? So those, those areas are the areas where actually most of the ice discharge occur, okay, because those are the marine termination. Once the, 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 the ice starts floating, after a while, the, the, let's say the, the, the fluxes of ice is not enough to maintain the platform forever, so they do not expand forever, and they calve, they form icebergs, okay? That's how Antarctica loses the mass in terms of iceberg calving. What I say before, it's those platforms are very vulnerable to oceanic warming. It means that also ocean melts them from below, okay? Because the ocean is much warmer than the ice. The ice is about minus 20 degrees. The ocean around is about minus one degree, minus 0.5 degrees. So it's it's much warmer. So the ocean melts the floating part of the of the of Antarctica, which here are shown by all those bright magenta and uh, dark blue colors, actually. So. I just uh, evidence here the sectors that are marine based and most vulnerable to oceanic warming. So um, this is because if we remove the ice, okay, this is what is below Antarctica. So this is the, the subglacial bed on which Antarctica uh, flows. And you can see that um, most of the bed below the ice, okay, is above sea level, okay? Those are all the brownish colors that you can see on the, on the picture. But most of Antarctica bed is also uh, below sea level. It has a, a, a topography that is below zero. What does that mean? Does it, mean it, it just means that most of the ice is, is, is not floating, it's just anchored on a bed that is below sea level, okay? And that makes the difference because, of course, um, if we are below sea level, we are much vulnerable to oceanic warming. And then, at some termination, we have those ice shelves, those floating platforms. <laughs> what about oceanic circulation around Antarctica? I mean, this, this slide is important just to make you understand where the heat is coming from. So around Antarctica, we have a, a main current, okay, westward flowing current that is called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, okay? This, this, polar, this uh, Antarctic polar circum, circumpolar current is wind-driven, okay? So above, the atmospheric circulation has strong westerlies that's, that really makes the, the design, the, the shape, the current around Antarctica. The Antarctic circumpolar current has always been there since the Drake Passage opened between the Patagonia and the peninsula. So it's dated back 34 million years ago, okay? That's when the, the passage really opened. So this is a very ancient current. It has always been there. And it isolates Antarctic, uh, Antarctica from the rest of the oceanic basins in the surface, okay? Because it's, it's not a deep current. Then around Antarctica, most of the heat 
is then advected toward the coastline from these currents, okay, which temperature is, is around one degree to minus one degree, okay, and most of the water is advected toward Antarctica because of existence of gyres, for example, like in the Ross Sea, which are regional currents that help the heat transport and also um, transport the fresh water melt from Antarctica to the ACC and to the Southern Ocean. If we look at the oceanic temperature, so this, this figure shows you what is around Antarctica, the, the oceanic temperature of water around Antarctica of this Antarctic Circumpolar Current. You can see that temperature varies um, from minus one to one degrees and actually is especially warm uh, along the coast of West Antarctica, okay, which is all this part here uh, on the picture. You can also see that on Antarctica, uh, the ice shelf, okay, so the floating part has been evidenced, and they show uh, actually the, the, um, the loss of uh, thickness of ice, okay, for the those ice shelf. And you can see that in this sector, those ice shelves are very red, okay. All those parts here are red, so it means that they are losing mass a lot, okay, compared to all the other parts that are shown floating also, but losing mass, but much less, okay. And this is because um, in this sector of Antarctica, the Antarctic circumpolar currents and the, the warm water, that, that the subcurrent that transport the warmth, which is the, the circumpolar deep water, okay, um, transport the heat almost directly to the coast of the of Antarctica, okay, which makes all the ice shelf there particularly sensitive to to the heat transport uh, and the, and the melt from the ocean warming. In other sectors, um, we have a lar uh, the, the heat has larger way, I mean, to go to reach the ice sheet because the continental platform is larger and the ice shelf are not directly exposed to the open ocean, so it makes them a little bit more protective from the rest of the the ocean heat advection. Now, if we look at what the satellite shows us in terms of changes in elevation of the ice sheet, we can see that all this part of West Antarctica has been losing a uh, lot of elevation, okay? means that it has been losing a lot of mass, a lot of ice, okay? Other sectors of Antarctica also show some uh, ice loss, and um, some of them are the marine base sector for, of East Antarctica, which we'll be talking about this, this afternoon, actually. But you can see that West Antarctica is the, the main sector of Antarctica that lose the elevation right now because of this impact of ocean heat transport and ocean melting from below the ice shelf that are, that are there. So that's, that's quite striking. Now, if we, if we combine all the numbers together and we, we make a sort of mean of mass loss uh, around the different sectors of Antarctica, um, this graph shows you how much Antarctica with the uh, purple curve has been contributing to sea level rise over the, since the, the 90s, actually. And you can see that most of this purple curve is mostly overimposed by the, the green curve, which is the contribution of West Antarctica. While you can see that East Antarctica has almost uh, zero contributions, okay? And uh, the Antarctic Peninsula has a, a, a contribution, but that cannot explain the, mass, the, the trend of Antarctic mass loss, actually. So this is quite clear from this graph that um, all the most of the contribution of Antarctica to the 20th century and uh, in the beginning of the 21st century is, is due to West Antarctic uh, melting, okay? Why now do ice shelves are so important? Because most of the, the ice sheet community now is not only focusing on ice shelves, but, but mostly because, as I say, I mean, those are the marine termination of all glaciers, so the outlets where the ice discharge into the ocean. And we say at the beginning that because it starts flocking on, on the ocean, there is no friction at the base of the ice. So the velocities are a few kilometers per year, okay? And the role of this ice shelf anyway, is to uh, maintain most of the inland, fl the, the, the inland ice on the continents, okay? So they, they, they act as uh, taps, uh, like uh, in bottle, for example. If we disintegrate those platforms, it's like removing a tap and the discharge, the ice flow accelerate, and there is a huge discharge from the inland flow until the ice sheet uh, in this sector reach a new equilibrium and stabilizes again, okay? And uh, it forms a new tap, okay, a new ice shelf, until it disintegrates again and 
uh, allow the, the flow to accelerate, increases the discharge and level rise contribution, and then stabilizes again. Okay, that's that would be a kind of uh, natural cycle of this kind of platform. But now if we destabilize them too fast, and most of them at the same time, let's say almost at the same time, then uh, it would induce a lot of ice discharge at the same time. And this is what are our future projections about. Such disintegration occur because we say mostly of oceanic warming and because of the warm water intruding below those floating platform uh, of, of Antarctica. So what happens? So you, you make the warm water penetrate into this, uh, below this ice shelf, okay? Then the ice shelf themselves are thinning, okay? Because they are melting from below. Because they thin, at some point, the ice flow coming from inland is not able to maintain the platform uh, as, a, as a whole, so it disintegrates. And the ice sheet's response is to step back, but it means that most of the ice that was stable at a point is just lost to, lost to the ocean, and it has to retreat back just to get a new stable position, okay? So that's called a marine ice sheet instability, and this is, uh, as, as the name says, an instability as such is hardly predictable, okay? Because it means that we have to determine the threshold of oceanic temperature from which then such disintegration might occur. Another kind of instabilities um, is what we call the marine ice cliff instability, okay? That also occur on the ice shelf and has the same effect. It's because it's due mostly on the surface melt of the surface melt, okay? Um, if the temperature are warm enough to produce melting at the surface of ice shelf, the melt water penetrates into the crevasse of the, of the those, those ice shelf. When the winter happens, it just froze again and then enlarged the cracks and create some hydrofracturing processes that uh, make it very easy then to uh, disintegrate if ocean warming below is, is particularly aggressive. So it also uh, produces a huge discharge of ice into the ocean and a, a very large sea level rise, even larger than the marine ash sheet instability because it combined both. An important aspect of those instabilities is that they can trigger everywhere. However, if the ice sheet is resting on a bedrock that is that has a slope oriented toward the interior, okay. So, in the sense of the in the direction of the retreat then of, of the glaciers, of course, it enhances the retreat because it, it it helps the ice to retreat further into the inland and to lose more ice. So, the configuration of the bedrock. Uh, sloping inland, okay, toward the interior is highly important. That's a very important factor. But that's also most uh, one of the sector of Antarctica that w where we have most of the knowledge gaps because it means that we have to see what is below the ice in Antarctica. And it, it seems easy to say, it's less easy to really observe. So we have few methods to, to really understand how is the bed um, in Antarctica, but most, in most sectors where, where we have those floating platforms, um, it's, we, st we are still lack lacking of data and we are still unsure of all the more, how the configuration of the bed is uh, in, all, in all those areas. So potentially we are also a bit underestimating the, some of the ice shelf vulner vulnerability. So now one of the ice shelf in West Antarctica is the Thwaites Glacier. The Swedes Glacier is a very good example of what's occurring to West Antarctica, okay? Most of the oceanic flows penetrate into the cavity, melt the ice shelf from below, and uh, we, have, we have been seeing the, this ice shelf thinning over the 21st century, and we are seeing the first sign of retreat, retreat of grounding line. So that's, that's a glacier that is potentially very, very sensitive and has the potential to drain a lot of ice mass into the ocean, um, leading to a few meters of sea level rise if it, if it occurs, okay? So that's, that's one of the main glaciers that is under uh, monitoring right now by, uh, by the community because of the potential sea level rise it might, it might cause. Now, if we have a look at the projections, okay, um, this is a timeline, okay, of the various scenarios that have been simulated by Rob uh, De Conto a few years ago. Um, uh, not, I'm not looking at it for the really the rate of global mean sea level rise, but more the timing of the different sectors. So the acronym corresponds to various sectors of Antarctica. What is important here is that this AC uh, acronym, okay, the second one, 
Okay, it represents this part of West Antarctica that is highly vulnerable to oceanic melting. And you can see that um, it's one of the first sector to trigger uh, in, in case of oceanic warming that is very high um, uh, in the uh, RCP 8.5 scenario, which is the worst case scenario, okay, the, the warmest one, actually, the one we are almost following the track right now. Okay, so that's the second sector to trigger. The first one is are the glaciers of the Antarctic Peninsula, but that's normal because they are located northward, so they are uh, subject to a warmer climate uh, context, let's say. But the second sector to trigger is West Antarctica, and then a few glaciers of East Antarctica, and then again West Antarctica, and then a few glaciers of East Antarctica. But so West Antarctica is the first one that would uh, be lost in case of uh, we cross the threshold of oceanic warming. How much... How, what is the timing of this, uh, uh, this such instability? So uh, about two centuries, two, five centuries, okay? Um, but the, the trigger is fast. As, as, far as, we, as soon as we cross the threshold, which we are not sure about, we could have already crossed it or not, then it has, anyway, long-term consequences because it's not that we disintegrate the entire West Antarctica in 10 years. It, it doesn't happen this way. Anyway... It just happens in two to three centuries in the simulations, okay? This sector of West Antarctica. It causes a multimeter sea level rise, okay, in two to three centuries. So it means at least one, one meter and a half by the end of the 21st century. So that, that's a lot. Because now if we think that we are already have, have been having 20 centimeters of the global sea level, mean sea level rise and many areas that are low-lying countries like uh, small Pacific Islands or other very low-lying countries are already suffering from sea level rise. Imagine one meter more plus the high tides and uh, storm surges. Oh, that's a very nice simulation done by my colleague here and a PhD student. That shows you, uh, in case of this uh, wor worst case scenario, okay, 8.5, what happens to uh, Antarctica uh, if it disintegrates? Not sure it would. So have a look at this sector here uh, that shows the brightest color. Um, basically, it shows you how the ice disintegrates uh, in time. You, you see the dark blue color uh, retreating back. Because as soon as the destabilization occurs, the grounding line is retreating. And most of the light blue colors and bright colors means that the ice is thinning, floating, disintegrating, and lost to the ocean. So that's quite fast. I mean, we lose a lot of, of sector in a few amount of time. And that's the projection, that official projection is done by uh, this um, intercomparison um, project uh, called ISMIP 6, okay, which uh, gather most of the ice sheet modelers of the community right now. So, um, while a few years ago, I would say, we were really unsure about this grounding line retreat and uh, a very uh, rapid ice discharge from those sectors, now we, are, we have been monitoring extensively from the ocean point of view, from the ice sheet point of view, and using different models to, to now understand much better than uh, many things that we have been observing that we didn't understand now, we are able to interpret them uh, and, and be a bit more sure that, okay, now we are running fast, <laughs> we are running against time, we're lacking of time, and we, we will probably lose those sectors anyway. Another important aspect of the ice is that it's like the ocean, it absorbs the heat on a very long time scale, so as such, it's, it, it, also, it also melts on a very long time scale. So even if we stop warming now, the warmth in the ocean will still continue to melt the ice shelf around Antarctica for a few centuries. So part of this process is unavoidable anyway. So this will happen no matter what we do. But this doesn't mean that we don't have to do anything. We have to mitigate as much as possible because the more warmth the ocean uptake absorbs, and of course, the larger ice discharge we would have afterwards. So it's, it's much better to uh, maintain all the, um, the global warmth to 1.5 degrees and perhaps even less, as paleo data are suggesting. So we are very sure to limit the silver rise, but we can't avoid it, so we have to adapt anyway. Um, it also happened in the past. I mean, that's the, the, the last slide of this presentation, but I wanted to give the, this, this past perspective because it's important to understand that what we're projecting is just not an invention. It's just not a science fiction movie. It's, it's really happening. So this graph shows you the reconstruction of CO2 in the past up to when Antarctica started to glaciate, so 34 million years ago. At that moment, the, the CO2 concentration, why... Uh, 1,000 ppm in the atmosphere, then it quickly dropped around 400, it stayed above 400 ppm for a while, 
and then after drop below the 400 and then 300 ppm, which is all what the ice core records are telling us about the last two million years of our uh, Earth's climate history. And then uh, in uh, our 21st and uh, 20 and 21st century, we have been rising the concentration again. And at the end, you can see the, the different scenarios of emission for the sectors in, West Antar in East Antarctica, but we'll speak about this afternoon. It happens another period where CO2 was a bit lower than 500 ppm. Okay, same sectors collapsed. You can see that Antarctica is not, is not uh, the whole ice sheet that we know today. And we know it also happened when CO2 was below 300 ppm. And that's the most interesting part because 300 ppm means that climate was cooler than today. It was about pre-industrial temperature and even a bit cooler. Okay. Now, I mean, nevertheless, uh, collapse happened because um, of some connection with the, the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere oceans, actually, that transport the heat from the pole to the equator and vice versa. Okay some heat transferred can occur in case Greenland ice sheet melt very fast in the northern hemisphere. In this case, it slows down the thermal line circulation in the northern hemisphere, but it transfers all the heat to the southern hemisphere, so it amplifies the Antarctic melting in that case. So even if CO2 is very low, collapse can happen because we melt other ice sheets in the northern hemisphere. 300 ppm, uh, it's very well below the, even the one degree target. 1.5, the degree target would be to go back to 360 ppm, okay? So if we want to really, say, let's say, secure a sea level rise that is about um, one meter, two meter, not more, we really need to stay below 1.5 degrees. I mean, so that's, that's the paleo perspective. Uh, so because of that, we are quite sure that uh, rising our CO2 in the atmosphere or our, uh, rising our carbon emission anyway in the future will make a uh, lot of Antarctic sector to, to collapse anyway and West Antarctica first. I think that's it. So if you have questions. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. With the rise in temperature, are we seeing an uh, increase in rainfall in Antarctica like we are in uh, Greenland? Okay, so Antarctica is really located at the South Pole, okay? So it's making it harder to see rainfall uh, until a while. Um, we, can to, we start to see rainfall uh, at the very end of the 21st century when temperatures are very high, uh, close to Antarctica. Then... Yes, some of the melt of Antarctica are at the surface that will occur at the end of the 21st century because temperature during summer start to be above zero is, are largely compensated by the, the gain of snow uh, and precipitation like uh, around Antarctica by the end of 21st century. But this, this, is, this will be short because as soon as we go up in temperature anyway, at some point the melting will be higher than uh, the gain of... Uh, and precipitation will not help further. Yeah. the question. <laughs> oh, sure. Hi. Um, my question, I was talking to Chen about this earlier, is um, I'm more uh, familiar with the Arctic uh, specifically. So I was kind of wondering what are the main differences you see um, between the Arctic and the Antarctic in terms of warming, just effects in general, uh, since I'm more familiar with the Arctic and uh, love learning about the Antarctic. 
Okay, so we are talking about two different contexts. Okay, so Antarctica is an ice sheet that rests, it's a terrestrial ice so rests on the continent that is very located South Pole. The Arctic is a, an ocean that is covered by sea ice during winter and normally <laughs> multi year ice during summer. Okay, so um, the main difference is that, for example, in, in Arctic, what happens is that um, the ocean warming causes a lot of summer sea ice melts, okay? And it has started also to retract the multi-year ice component of the sea ice. And uh, this one was a bit perennial from our uh, time scale point of view, let's say. And um, when you remove the sea ice during the summer, uh, the ocean surface is much darker than the sea ice surface, which is completely white. So the sea ice surface reflects 90% of solar radiations. So if you remove the, the white surface, what you see below is the ocean surface, which has a, a much darker surface. So it absorbs the heat instead of reflecting. So it's a positive feedback. You retract the sea ice and the ocean below absorbs more heat. So it, it's warming more. So you, you retract more sea ice, etc. So in the Arctic, uh, the projections say that that mid-century we lose completely the summer sea ice cover. Then it freezes again during the winter, but we lose the sea ice summer. So it means that it will warm and warm and warm and warm and warm. In the Antarctic, it's completely different because this is an ice sheet, uh, three kilometers thick. And um, so it's vulnerable to ocean warming at the margin, as we say, because of this instability and the role of ice shelf in maintaining the flow inside the <laughs> inland on the continent and thus regulating the ice discharge into the ocean. It takes a while for the ice sheet to really um, contribute very much to sea level change. That's why the two different scenarios by the end of the 21st century, they are, it is different, not that much. But if you look on the long-term projection that shown by IPCC, so by 2300, there you see the divergence between the scenarios. But the, the processes are different. The Arctic is warming so fast, much faster than Antarctica because of ocean warming and the changes in the reflectivity of the surface. While Antarctica still takes a while to, to really, to, to, to really um, uh, let's say, uh, have a, a real strong impact. Because right now, in the two scenarios, it is projected that Antarctica have about 15 centimeter contribution by the end of 21st century. Then going beyond, because of this impact of thermal inertia of the ice, then the, the contribution st starts to be higher because of instabilities behavior and uh, very fast discharge on this on this time scale. So that's main, mainly the two differences of the region. Okay. <laughs> but if you don't have any further questions, uh, thank you very much. And, uh, see you soon. Come to this event this afternoon about uh, East Antarctica. 1 p.m. Yeah, 1 p.m. sharp here. <laughs> <laughs>